And now uh, the presentation is a short insight into the Hungarian language policy, dreams and realities. Well, you can see this motto, well, it's, it's, it has been translated into, into quite a few languages. And the first slide you can see that language policy covers the following areas. I, I think we all know this, so I don't want to, to speak about this. Um, but the second one, um, no, it's the third one. No, okay, that's the second one. Uh, our main concern, as far as language policy is concerned, I think that language is taught at schools. Uh, in Hungary, it is of vital importance. So the questions are the following. How many languages do we talk? That's, that's a very important question because, as we all know, Hungary or Hungarian is not a widely spoken language, unfortunately. Uh, then the second question is when to start teaching languages. It's, it's again uh, very important. And, okay, that's all. Because sociologists, psychologists, language teachers, have very, um, I would say, harsh debate on when to start language teaching at all, at the age of, say, six or five or ten or, you know. And, of course, the finance department or the finance people decide, unfortunately. Another uh, important question to my mind is, at what school type, what languages should be taught? Compulsory or optional? It's again a question because, okay, you can say that you should learn one foreign language, say, from the age of eight. Or you can choose. So it's again a very fishy question. There was an idea, sort of, that it would be very good to learn two languages, two, not, uh, well, Western European sort of languages, and one language of the neighboring countries. And of course, nothing came out of this project, unfortunately. And of course, the problems of teacher training, I think it's, but it's, it's another matter now, and the teaching materials. Um, in Hungary, yes? Yeah, that, that is the, in Hungary, we have the national curriculum, and it lays down the following, the number of languages, which is minimum two, then the requirements to be achieved by the end of the primary and secondary school, um, by the end of the primary school, A2 level is required, it's the first language, uh, it's the eighth grade. Uh, by the end of the secondary school, the same language, mind you, it's B1. Uh, the number of years to be taught, which is nine years altogether, which is quite something, I would say. And, and you can see the first language starts at the fourth grade and the second at the ninth grade. Um, it's again very strange that our pupils study or learn, for that matter, nine years. And I've read in one of, uh, one of the books uh, which, uh, which was uh, speaking about statistics or writing about statistics, and they said that they have all together, during the nine years, 948 lessons. To be honest, I haven't counted, so I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's again quite something. And in spite of this fact, it's terrifying, I would say, how ineffective our language teaching is. So now the whys come, and the problems. Well, one of the problems is the number of lessons, which is either two or three, which is, we all know that it's really nothing. The choice of languages, well, it's again, it's again problematic, because you wouldn't believe it, but everybody wants to learn English, of course. And uh, slowly but surely, Europe is becoming, or has already become, a monolingual place with English the dominating and, and uh, prevailing language. And the other thing is, if poor kids wanted to learn another language, then the parents say what? No, no, English is of, yes, English is number one. So you are, of course I'm exaggerating now a bit, but you are not allowed to learn any other but English. Then the books, believe it or not, the books are a problem in Hungary because on the one hand they are very expensive, but that's another thing. But these books are usually written by foreign authors and Hungarian belongs to a different language family. So grammar-wise you can imagine that it's a, well I wouldn't say it's a complete chaos, but tends to be. Then the teachers, sorry to say, but not all the teachers are very good language-wise, I mean. And the reason, one of the reasons for this is, you might know that Russian was compulsory up to the change of regime, 1989. 
and there were quite a few Russian teachers, then it ceased to be. Okay, then there were quite a few Russian teachers, mainly women. What on earth can we do with them? Yeah? Either they are sacked, fired, or there was a retaining program. So uh, there are quite a few retained teachers, and I must say that from, from good Russian teachers, they became um, not that good English, German, and French teachers. So it is a problem even today. Then the children, quite a few are not motivated, yeah? or they are not interested, or lazy, because there is a tendency, and I I'm sure not only in Hungary, but the world over, that school is a place where you can have the time of your life. It's very good to have, you know, you feel yourself well and that's okay. Huh? And kids have different mental abilities. And that's, that's true again. And even I would blame sort of the methods as well. But again, in our case, the good old grammar translation method would be useful sometimes, as far as Hungarian language is concerned. Yeah, so these are the problems. And now my <laughs> wishes or dreams are well. Teaching should be realized in small groups at every level. I'm absolutely convinced that it would, it would mean something, even at adult education. Um, that's a very good um, initiative in Hungary. This language teaching should start at the kindergarten. Of course, it wouldn't be teaching proper. Uh, this is a very interesting initiative. Uh, we have bilingual kindergartens, only in English, unfortunately where they have, the structure is sort of tandem-like, but not really, because it's, of course, not the same. The kids have two teachers, one Hungarian, kindergarten teachers, I mean, one Hungarian and one native, in this case, English. And I just couldn't imagine how on earth it can work. So the, the, what, what type of structure is that? And once I visited a, a kindergarten like this, and you know I was shocked positively, so it was a positive stress, not, <laughs> not a negative one. I was just gaping. Kids were uh, four or five. They could communicate in English, just as the English would say, you could have not me down with a feather, you know, like gaping. And the thing is, the Hungarian kindergarten teacher says something, and then, yeah, and the native speaker says, yeah, says the same immediately. Go to the yard because the weather is nice now, blah, 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 blah. And it does work. It was just, you know, fascinating. Uh, of course, there are not too many bilingual kindergartens. There are, thank God, there are some primary schools, and uh, as far as I know, only one secondary school. So there is no succession. That's the problem, no? And the problem is money because, of course, the English native teachers, they have to be paid for the job they do. Um, again, I have this uh, motto by Platon that all learning is best on display, and again, coming back to kindergarten, because I think that some language, nursery rhymes, riddles, etc., could be um, uh, at kindergartens as well, just to make kids realize that there is more than Hungarian, you know? just to feel an other language. And at the junior, junior section of the primary school, one, two, or three lessons. Of course, not lesson proper. And then at least four lessons in the senior section. Problem again, you can read it. I don't want to repeat the word money again <laughs> because it's really, really terrible. Um, okay, um, at secondary schools, um, that was a very good initiative, back to, to the 60s, mind you. But there were these specialized language classes, which meant they had foreign language lessons every day. Well, I myself attended a class like that, and it's quite okay. Then, there are bilingual classes where certain, there were, I would say, because uh, the number is decreasing, unfortunately. Bilingual classes where certain subjects are taught in the foreign language, at best, all the subjects, except, of course, the mother tongue. Then, there were, again, our language prep courses for one year. So before they start secondary education, they attend the school and they have only language, which is again a very good, very good initiative, award. And is a very good initiative. Uh, they had at least 12, 15, or sometimes even 20 lessons per week. 
which is something. No? Then another option could be extracurricular activities. By this I mean, for example, I don't know whether you use the study circle. By study circle I mean that um, in the afternoon it's a loose get together, they can listen to, to each other, talk, watch films and things like that. Or pupils exchange, like Erasmus but on a lower level of course. Or excursion to the target language country, problem again the same unfortunately. Um, again a um, uh, proverb, there is nothing new under the sun from the Bible. Um, and I'll tell you later, a bit later, why is it, uh, it is there. I, I was just dreaming a possible structure for secondary grammar schools, trilingual Europe, yeah? At the age of 10, Latin, at the age of 12, German, and at the age of 14, English, French, Italian, or whatever. So it's a sort of optional thing. And believe it or not, this structure was introduced in Hungary for secondary grammar school in 1926. I believe that. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, another structure could be, but the motto is not there. But I'm just, I'm just saying that it could be two languages for everybody. Uh, the first language should be compulsory, starting at the age of nine or ten, and it could be English or German. And the second language could be optional. Of course, it depends on if you have the teachers, etc. So it's again a very complicated thing. Um, before this. Uh, you might ask that, okay, uh, once having done with public education, uh, why don't you speak about tertiary education? Well, I have two reasons for that. One is, if all these dreams came true, then there would be an ideal situation in tertiary education. Yes, every single student could speak, or would have a good command of at least two languages, so why bother to speak about it? But the second and sad reason is, no language policy at higher education, believe it or not. I, I have been looking high and low, really, for, for finding something. And the only thing I could find is the requirement, of course. Without the way getting to the requirement. The requirement is after the, no, not after, but by the end of, of bachelor's degree, they have to have B2 level one language. That's it. Master's degree, the institution itself can decide if wants another exam or not, but B2 is enough. But while looking for different materials, I found a very, very good book, Language Policy in Higher Education, which was published in 2014 in December, so it's brand new, it's not on the, on the board. And there I could find, it's a very good summary, you can find on the net, and I could find a very good, very good sentence. In fact, it's a question. To what extent is English really pushing other languages out of the academic environment? No? And so the greatest question is, okay, it's, it's, it's sort of a joke, must really everybody know one foreign language at all? And before you, you start thinking of, of giving an answer, allow me to read one of my half-minute stories, which is again a sort of, a, sort of an answer to this question. And um, the title is Knowledge of Languages. Everybody in the family worked as a lawyer, his parents, grandparents, great-grandfather. He read low too, but he loved languages, and as if a hobby, he got a degree as a teacher of German and English languages. But he did his practice, his low practice, at a very famous lawyer's office. Arriving there, the first question was what he knew. Well, you know, I can speak English, German, Russian, and French quite well, he said. Well, my boy, sorry to say, but there is no need for this in this office. Thank you for your attention.